Today, uh, we're probably in the main character in all of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, kind of the center character. When you think of a prophet, when I grew up as a child, I always thought when, when somebody said the name prophet, who, what was the prophet that you thought of? Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Okay, well, that's different. I would, that makes sense. What? Elijah? I always thought I, Isaiah. You know, because of all the different prophecies about the birth of Christ and stuff. But they're all derivatives of the guy today, Moses. He's the prophet. That it even says at the end of um, Deuteronomy, it'll say, um, no one has since that day risen like Moses. They're still waiting for another Moses. Well, he does come. His name is Jesus. But... Uh, There is no one that has risen in all of Israel up to that day that is like Moses to take his place. And yet Moses prophesied himself about someone in the future. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of Israel has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. You probably, some of you cannot help but think of the scenes from the Ten Commandments by Cecil B. DeMille when you see this, and Charlton Heston standing before this burning bush Um, Others maybe think of the Prince of Egypt, um, the Disney animated flick. Um, DreamWorks. DreamWorks. Oh, it's DreamWorks. It's not Disney. Oops. Um, Yeah, you might be thinking of those things. Um, The problem with Cecil B. DeMille, by the way, is uh, not him personally. I don't know him or what. But um, Moses does look like a very heroic figure in that book. Here, um, he's trying to get out of actually doing what God wants him to do if you read more of the text, okay? But, um, you know, most people, and this is where we're going today, we're going to look at two different points today, um, but most people today believe in the existence of God still in our day and age, in our culture. Um, I'd say 85 to 90% will say, I believe there is a God who exists, But that's about as far as it goes. They're not quite sure who that God is, what that God is like, or how he's supposed to be. 
And for what we can tell, Moses also believed that God exists, that there, are, there might have been multiple gods for him at the time that he was called by God and then started to believe in this God. But before the burning bush appears, he doesn't seem to know who this God is. In fact, you notice in this text, he doesn't know his name. It's like, well, if I'm going, but how am I supposed to refer to you? So here is the first time Moses meets God, or better to say, God meets Moses, okay? That's the story of the Bible, by the way, that a, and Abraham Heschel in his book called The Prophets puts it correctly. He says, all of human history as seen by the Bible is a history of God in search of man. Israel's faith is not the fruit of a quest for God. Israel did not discover God. Israel was discovered by God. The Bible is a record of God's approach to man. Do you realize that? We sing um, the song, um, your goodness is running after me. And when I look back at my life, I see God's hand in it all. And often we think we're the center of our story, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, it's, uh, we're pretty, uh, pretty egotistical about all that. And yet God has been involved since before you were born. Isn't that amazing? And this story about Moses is really not even about Moses. Okay? Like I've said before, the characters in the Bible aren't the heroes. It's God who is the only hero. Gerhard von Rod, um, an Old Testament theologian years ago, said not one, a single one of all these stories in which Moses is a central figure really was about, written about Moses. And that uh, might make Cecil B. DeMille and DreamWorks and others uh, take a back seat. It's really about God. And so what we're going to learn in the story about us, the story of us, is really it's the story of God with us. Maybe that would have been a better title, but, you know, you get it, right? We're going to learn these two points today, that God is real and can be known, and that God is the one who cares, Okay, so God is real and can be known. Now, that sounds pretty basic, doesn't it? God is real. Yeah. Um, and, and most people say, yes, God is real. But most of the time when people say God is real, God is very abstract, generalized, and over there somewhere. Um, philosophically, they'll believe in God, but they have no idea who this God is or what they are. And most people, we all do this. We tend to project on God kind of our wish dreams for what we want him to be. Okay? So this is what my needs are. This is how God will work. But the question is, how does that really work that way? Um, I think, for instance, I think you have more respect for the weather than that kind of a belief that you could just make God into whatever you want. I mean, honestly, I'd love to believe South Florida, Southwest Florida, that every day is sunny and mild with a few clouds in the skies, about 80 degrees, 20% humidity-ish or so. And when it does rain, it rains at night like Camelot. No? Do you remember? OK. Um, but it ain't so. No matter how much I want to project on the weather in the morning, you, when you are in southwest Florida this time of the year, you better have your umbrella with you and just recognize the weather is the way the weather is. And I think that's true as well about God. You can try to project onto God whatever you want, but you're going to have to deal with the reality of who God is and who God has said he is and how he has approached us. And um, there are huge consequences for what you believe about God. Mortimer Adler said, more consequences for thought and action follow the affirmation or denial of God than an for answering any other basic question. Okay? I use this quote at the beginning of World Religions at FGCU just to say, hey, this is not a side subject. Most students are taking it as a humanities credit just for fun. Um, and it's just kind of a side subject. It's something to dabble in. It's like a hobby. Or, no, 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 no. What you believe about God matters more than almost anything else. You, more than whether you believe gravity is real 
or the laws of physics or how the world works because guess who made all of those things? God. God is the ground of our being, the direction of the universe. And if you don't know who this God is, the Bible would say, then you really don't know who you are, where you're going, or how everything turns out. And if you don't know those things, you're basically walking through life a bit clueless. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but you go like, oh, how do you get all this from this text? Because, you know, we try to preach textually. That is, I'm not just trying to come up with my own ideas here. And I think in this text, there are a couple of things that, um, as I was studying it this week, that really kind of point to it. First of all, in this text, did you notice how God appears to Moses is in this burning bush. The angel of the Lord is in this burning bush, but the bush does not burn. Do you know what that means? Have you ever made a fire, a campfire? What do you need? Kindling, wood. You need fuel, right? You have no fuel, you have no fire. Here's a fire that needs no fuel. What is that saying about God? God is completely self-sufficient within himself. He is, well, I am who I am, is the other way that he describes himself in this passage. He says, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So, That, as well as that fire, the fact that God is absolutely the one self-generating, needs nothing, needs no one, is not dependent or contingent on anything in all of the universe. In fact, the entire universe is contingent on this God. Totally different than anything else in all creation. I am who I am. It's a hard translation. It's the Hebrew word for to be. Um, Yahweh, as um, he is, that, or Echyeh, which is I am. But what is, it's kind of what God is saying to Moses is, uh, you tell them that being, the one who is, the one who is being, is present, not The one who is contingent on any, every other being in this universe, every other thing is always contingent, dependent, or comes from or derives from something else. No matter how much you believe about yourself, you did not create yourself. (laughs) Have you noticed? You didn't, uh, you did not spontaneously decide anything. (laughs) Um, we don't have to go into all the processes of procreation for you to know that you did not make yourself you were dependent and we have some children in our midst and whether they want to believe how independent they are or not they are still very dependent on their parents you have been dependent on someone else since you were conceived you wouldn't be here But God is the being himself who is absolutely independent, free, absolutely not contingent on anything or anyone at all. So what are we to make of this? Now, first of all, you can make kind of on the philosophical side of things that this is one of the best explanations or... um, Argument, it's not really an argument, it's not a proof for the existence of God. You know, the fact that everything else in all of creation that you can think of has been created by or dependent on something else, that something else came before it. But somewhere back there, there must be an uncaused cause. Did you get it? That something, somehow, because I, my parents, their parents, you can go all the way back, right? Every living being, everything actually, every star, every planet, every part of the solar system and galaxy and universe has been derived from something else. So that's called the uncaused cause. So what is that? And that's what 
Moses finds out, this is God. I am who I am. I'm the one who's always, there has never been a time that I wasn't. There has never been a time that I will not be. I am who I am. I am being itself. Now, somebody like uh, Richard Dawkins, have you ever heard of him? He's one of the new atheists around. He would say, well, wait a minute. If everything is caused by something else, then who caused God or what caused God, you know? Um, but I think Richard Dawkins is kind of missing something on that now. Because he would say, well, you know, all this just began spontaneously in some form. It happened. But do you realize, you know, what that is? That itself is called a miracle. That all of a sudden things came into being without a god. Well, um, look it up. Richard, I think that's called a miracle itself. And others might say, well, but there's always been something. But we know everything is contingent, and nothing, nothing is eternal. Even matter and energy, you know, it's not eternal. So if you believe that there's always been something eternal, then that's also called a miracle. So you've got a choice between three different miracles that God is, that matter is, or that nothing was but became something out of nothing with no explanation. Miracle always. Now, I know philosophically we're not really trying to do much with that. I, I think it's kind of nice to think through that there are some good reasons to believe the existence of God, but I want to talk more practically because I think that's where the Bible would really be focusing on. We have a God who is dependent on nothing and no one. And that is both humbling, but also very liberating if you accept the humility that's behind it. Now, why I say it's humbling? Because, well, we kind of like to think that we're in charge. Have you noticed that? I, I still recall this ad on TV. It's from some lawyer firm or something that's saying, Ah, uh, this guy is trying to promote himself as far as the person you would want to call up. And he says, I've worked hard all my life for everything that I have earned. I was taught all this good work, et cetera, yada, yada, yada. And I'm thinking, that's a bunch of baloney. <laughs> you worked hard with the gifts you were given, the body you were given, the place and the opportunities you were given, there is nothing that, you, and even the hard work that you do and the sweat that comes off your brow is also a gift from God. You are absolutely dependent on God. And that might pull the rug out from under you in terms of your own self-sufficiency and independence, but it's also very liberating to know you're not running the universe. You never have, you never will, and you don't need to. Uh, Martin Luther, the reformer, um, had a very dear friend named Philip Melanchthon, who actually was probably a better exegete theologian, Hebrew scholar, Greek scholar than Martin Luther. Um, but the two of them worked together in Wittenberg, Germany. And, and Philip Melanchthon, <laughs> was a worrier. He was filled with lots of anxieties at time. And so when, when Luther saw his friend Philip in that state again, he would look at him and say, Philip, let Philip stop running the universe. It's time to stop feeling like you're in control, because you've never been in control. Now, it's kind of ironic that Luther did that, because Luther himself, he didn't deal with anxiety as much as depression. And there were times that he'd just be in such a dark mood, his wife, Katie, would look at him and go like, how am I going to get him out of this mood? And so once in a while, she would go to her closet, change clothes, come out in full black, and be walking around the house doing her chores. And then Luther would finally wake up and go like, Katie, what happened? Who died? And, and he said, oh, she, she would say to him, well, I thought God must have died because of the way you've been acting. Yeah, no, God is. God is. Everything is dependent upon him. God is real and makes the absolute difference in your life. He can be known. And then secondly, our second point is God cares. This might even be more um, distinct about 
the Hebrew scriptures, the Bible itself, from other world religions than anything. So in Exodus chapter 3, 7 to 8, God says this, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So God is not simply a force out there. God is absolutely right here. He is not detached from the world, but he is totally, absolutely cares about what's going on in history and in this world. The whole Bible is a story about God's concern for humanity. This is so distinct from the philosophies and the ancient world religions that were around at the time. Those gods in Babylon that the Babylonians talked about, they didn't care about the sufferings of humanity. In fact, they brought about some of that suffering because they created, according to their creation accounts, Marduk and the others created humanity to be their slaves, to take care of all the dirty work they didn't want to do. And the Greek gods were basically totally not involved in human affairs. They didn't care about human beings. They, did, they were all wrapped up in themselves. That's why Abraham Heschel says this, the God of the philosophers is unknown and indifferent to man. He thinks but does not speak. He is conscious of himself but oblivious to the world. Well, the God of Israel is a God who loves a God who is known to and concerned with man. He not only rules the world in the majesty of his might and wisdom, but reacts intimately to the events of history. And here we have Moses, who has no clue who this God is. He doesn't know God's name or what God is like. And yet God is the one who tells him, I have seen the suffering of my people, the people of Israel, and he has not given them up. Once he said, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, he has made a choice. He has committed himself to these people. He has committed himself to this world. You know, I don't know if you realize this, but this is a huge issue because people who say they believe in God, you know, they're not sure. I mean, they think he's kind and benevolent probably, most likely cares. But when a crisis comes in their life, they betray the fact that they don't quite trust that this God cares. Do you know how? They start to pray, and they pray, Lord, if you, if you would answer this prayer, if you would take care of this situation, then I will. Somehow they think they have to get God's attention. Somehow they think they have to do something to let make God care. Somehow they think they have to make a deal. Like, the... oh, and all along, God cares more about that situation than they do. God cares more about everything about your life more than you do about your own life. How do I know that? Because he says in this text, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And by the way, that's not, that's a step down, not a step up for God. (laughs) I'm the God of Abraham. Um, I work with people, I work with some pretty unpromising individuals. (laughs) You remember Abraham the coward? And Isaac the dysfunctional father? And Jacob the the trickster. Yeah, that's whom I'm committed to. And I'm committed to the people of Israel named after Jacob, that trickster. And you realize after this story happens, when he rescues Israel out of Egypt, if God really wanted to take a noble people, a sophisticated people, a wonderful people, he should have taken the Egyptians out of Egypt and left Israel behind. But he takes Israel, this slave people that don't even know his name, and what do they do? They whine and complain and mumble and grumble all the way through the wilderness. And while Moses, God speaks at Mount Sinai, and they hear his voice, they're afraid to even listen. They hear the Ten Commandments, I am the Lord your God, 
who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, have no other gods before me. Moses goes up the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, and what did the people do? They break the first commandment and worship the golden calf right at the same time. This is the people that God has committed himself to. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And in God's holiness, in his God's perfection, it's amazing. It's amazing that he doesn't just wipe them all out. And in this story, what's fascinating is that God appears to Moses in a burning bush. Now, the Hebrew word is very specific. It's the Hebrew word seneh, which has got the same letters, actually, the same consonants as the name Sinai. Mount Horeb here, but now it'll be Sinai from now on, and it's really saying bush mountain. You know, it's the, the mountain that God has appeared at the bush, Mount Sinai. And it, of all things, it's an Ara Arabic loan word, and it seems to mean, because it's, this is the only time it's used for a bush, it seems to mean a thorn bush, maybe even a blackberry bush. What's fascinating is it's a thorn bush. And if you realize the hyperlinks that Exodus 3 is trying to bring into your mind is, well, wait a minute, thorns, thistles. Hmm, where do I hear that elsewhere? Oh, back at the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were <laughs> rebellious. And then God, drew, uh, God said, Cursed is the ground, from it now comes thorns and thistles. And here, God chooses to reveal himself in the midst of thorns, the curse that was placed upon the ground as a result of Adam's rebellion. God reveals himself in the midst of thorns. One of my um, mentors, uh, Pastor Tom Zender, was telling me way back uh, in my internship that he had talked with a rabbi one time on the east coast of Florida, and he said, uh, and the rabbi shared with Pastor Tom, well, you know, this sana, this thorn bush, you realize um, uh, it shows up again in your New Testament, in the Gospels. Where? The crown of thorns placed on Jesus' head that Greek word can mean a blackberry bush. How do I know that God cares? Because he comes in the midst of thorns. He comes in the midst of the curse that was placed on this earth. He comes in the midst of the brokenness, and he takes that curse upon himself. Now, the Greeks, like we've talked about before, Aristotle, what's amazing to me is Aristotle says this. He says, for friendship exists only where there can be a return of affection, but friendship toward God does not admit of love being returned and not at all of loving, for it would be strange if one would say that he loved Zeus. The philosophical version of God, the God that most people seem to be believing in because they don't know who he is, where he is, or how he is, tends to be a God that you wouldn't love because he just is. But this God that actually shows up, that finds Moses, that takes Moses where he is, that comes in the midst of thorns, is a God who will suffer along with his people through whatever, no matter what, to hold on to them, to have them, to, to say, I will be with you. Isn't that amazing? And the big question really at this uh, story might not be, well, why doesn't the bur bush burn up? The real question is, why didn't Moses burn up? How is it that God can come into our presence because God says, you know, you can't handle my holiness. And he's right. Any time that God approaches humanity in the Old Testament, like Isaiah, woe is me, I'm ruined. 
I've just seen the train of his robe. That's enough. I'm dead. Anytime God would approach in his holiness, we should be crispy critters. We should be dead. But God chooses through thorns to approach us in the person of Jesus Christ on a dead tree on another mountain. And it doesn't kill us, it kills him. So that you would have life, so that he could be close to you. There has been a death. You might wonder, how could God ever work in your life? Well, like I said, he's already worked in your life because he's hung on a tree with a crown of thorns on his head for you. So God is real, and he cares, and he works with the most <laughs> unpromising material of all, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Phil, and John, and Mark, and Chris, and Hannah, all of us. He is real, and you can know him, and he really cares. Let's pray. Lord, thank you this day. Um, this story is not really about Moses, but about you and your goodness and your grace and how you chose to rescue your people who didn't even know you anymore, Lord God. And we thank you. Thank you for your grace in our lives as well. Thank you, Lord, that we are not the center of the universe and that we never have been and we can't control things and we don't need to. We can cast all our anxieties on you because you care for us. Thank you, Lord, that we do not have to take on the burdens of this world and get depressed about all the, the problems that we see right now and the injustices across the globe, Lord God, but we know that you are the one who cares and you are the one who is here and you are the one who has the remedy and you, Lord Jesus, are the one who has died and risen and again to bring us that life. We thank you for that. Lord, as we prepare ourselves for the Lord's Supper this morning, actually we ask you to prepare us for this supper this morning. We know that if we say we have no sin, we would be deceiving ourselves. We are no better than Moses. We are just right like him. But as we confess our sins, Lord, you forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you prepare us to be touched by you, Lord God, that you can come close to us in all of your goodness and righteousness. And it doesn't put us to death, but it gives us life. We thank you for this gift, Lord God, for your forgiveness and grace in our lives. We pray, Lord, that you'd bring your healing presence also to everyone in this congregation. And you know right now what each of us needs individually we offer that to you you know right now how how we have been anxious lord like philip melanchthon and we've acted like we're in control lord we surrender that control now to you we know how like luther we may have gotten depressed and down but we realize you have risen from the dead lord jesus you are alive and you are present even in the midst of the thorns and thistles of this world. We ask that you would use our ministry here at Thrive for the sake of both Florida Gulf Coast University and this greater community, Lord, so that many will know that you are real, that you can be known, and that you do care. All this we lift up to you as we offer ourselves to you and our offerings this morning. In your precious name, dear Jesus, amen.